Hi, it's Dwyer, DwyerCrime.blog, also RichardDwyer.co. It is the morning after the guilty verdict across the board in the George Floyd murder trial. Let's give some final thoughts, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now let me just encourage people here online, whatever your view, whether you think this is a just verdict or whether you think it's an unjust verdict, to leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. If you'd like, you could also leave it on my Twitter account at at Dwyer70905. Again, at Dwyer70905. Let's have the discussion. Let's make it interactive. Now, I recognize that there are many in the legal profession, including Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe, who believes that this was a case of clear-cut liability, of clear-cut guilt right? I'm not among those. You know that I would have voted to acquit on all three charges, right? I view this case as a jury nullification case. In other words, I believe there's some members of the jury, and I'm speculating here, who fully know, <clears throat> fully know that the prosecution did not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Let me just say, I, um, <clears throat> in running a crime blog, uh, in practicing law myself, I've watched my share of closing arguments. And I thought the defense, Attorney Nelson, threw down a great closing that really showed the problems with the prosecution's case. In other words, the prosecution was the side with the burden. In my opinion, they did not come close to removing reasonable doubt from this case. I really view this case as one where <clears throat> the jurors wanted to make a statement. They wanted to go outside of the law, my opinion. Right? Not Lawrence Tribe and countless others who feel otherwise. But I feel that the jurors wanted to make a statement here. And I believe they recognized that the evidence wasn't conclusive. The evidence left open the possibility that, in fact, George Floyd was not assaulted by Derek Chauvin that Derek Chauvin didn't do a predicate felony on which to hang a second-degree murder conviction, that the only reason George Floyd is out in the street is because George Floyd, after committing a crime, would not get in the police car, flatly refused, was resisting arrest, right? So, <clears throat> let's just talk about areas of reasonable doubt. In the comment section in this video, please feel free to disagree with me. Tell us your theory of the case and other YouTubers can discuss it. First, it's a lay jury, right? You don't have Marcus Welby and Dr. Kildare on the jury. It's a lay jury. <clears throat> They're not supposed to be medical experts. So here you have clear conflicting medical examiner testimony. It's in conflict, folks. It's a direct contradiction on cause of death, right? You have the Hennepin County medical examiner who on the stand admitted that he felt that the cause of death, his words, were a multifactorial process. 
again, multifactorial process, that there was no single cause of death. Now, I know some people are going to say, well, his ME report talked about subdural restraint, right? Just understand, he actually testified under penalty of perjury. He used the phrase multifactorial process in talking about the contributing factors that led to the death. And he mentioned things like fentanyl and methamphetamines that George Floyd took. He mentioned things like a 90% blocked heart artery and a 70% blocked artery, an enlarged heart that George Floyd had. Now, folks, that's a state witness. That's the Hennepin County ME telling you that a lot was involved in George Floyd's death. Well, then you had David Fowler, the state of Maryland's former medical examiner, a guy with extensive experience, <clears throat> who told you that because of all of the factors that went into George Floyd's death, including fentanyl, including methamphetamine, that the cause of death was undetermined. Undetermined. Now, given this testimony, where the medical examiners are talking about drug use, recent drug use, coupled with an enlarged heart, and some lung problems. It's astonishing. It is simply astonishing that the jury could then decide that the pressure applied to George Floyd by the police was a significant contributing factor to his death. Simply shocking. Right? Understand, when an Emmy is telling you it's undetermined, which is what David Fowler told you, undetermined, how could a jury reach another conclusion? Right? Did they not believe David Fowler? Did they not believe Hennepin County Medical Examiner, Andrew Baker, who described it as a multifactorial process. How do you know which factors contributed significantly? You have a causation problem here. Well, let's also talk about something else that hasn't been discussed enough. You know, in Andrew Baker's testimony, he referred to the word fatal in discussing the dose of fentanyl that George Floyd had in his system. He even went so far as to say that had he just found George Floyd dead, he would have ruled a fentanyl overdose. Now, one has to wonder logically how having a cop then on top of a guy who would have been ruled a fentanyl overdose somehow makes it a murder. Especially when the only reason the guy's on top of George Floyd is as part of an arrest after George Floyd has passed counterfeit currency. But just be aware of the fact that Andrew Baker <clears throat> talked about a fatal dose of fentanyl. In an earlier video here, I actually read portions of Andrew Baker's trial testimony from a transcript that was made available to the public by CNN. Right, so the Hennepin County Medical Examiner, 
<clears throat> Andrew Baker talked about a fatal dose of fentanyl. Now let me ask a question here that I believe the jury should have asked. Where is the evidence here that George Floyd had a high tolerance to fentanyl? Was any presented? Right? Without evidence of George Floyd having a high tolerance to fentanyl, the fact that he had a fatal dose of fentanyl in his system at the time of his death opens the door to reasonable doubt on his death. How do we know that this wasn't a guy who had recently taken fentanyl who then dies, regardless of everything else that's happening? Again, you have David Fowler's testimony, the state of Maryland's medical examiner, that the death, the cause of death was undetermined. You couple that with evidence that George Floyd had a fatal dose of fentanyl in his system at the time of the death. And how could you find anybody guilty of murdering him? Let's also talk about the murder two conviction for a moment here. Right now, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you have to find an underlying felony that Derek Chauvin is committing to get to this murder two conviction. You have to find that Derek Chauvin is criminally assaulting George Floyd, right? Criminally assaulting him to reach the conclusion that he should be found guilty of murder two under the state of Minnesota's laws. Now, let's just ask some basic questions here. And I mean basic. The Hennepin County Medical Examiner talked about there being no bruising on his skin. No bruising on his neck muscles under the skin. No blocked airwaves. We also know that while George Floyd is being restrained, the paramedics have already been called. They're on their way. They're on their way while he's there on the street. We also know, and it's no secret, that Derek Chauvin knows he's being filmed as he's restraining George Floyd. Right, we see him look at the camera as he's being filmed. Not only that, we know that the cops themselves have on body cameras. So he knows he's being filmed both by observers and by the police themselves. Is it plausible that under these circumstances that he makes a decision to assault, to criminally assault George Floyd? Is that what folks believe? I mean, isn't he with George Floyd after George Floyd has fought getting into the car, has used his legs, the paramedics have been called, Floyd has suffered a nose injury. This is before he's on the floor, folks. And Derek Chauvin then has him on the floor with the paramedics already on their way. The paramedics can show up at any time. And of course, Derek Chauvin is surrounded by cops. Right? There's a cop standing right in front of him looking at the crowd. Let's just say I personally find 
the idea of a criminal assault felony on which to base a murder to conviction to require a bit of creative thinking. So make no mistake, uh, I just want to be as clear as possible here. And I know people disagree with me and I'll let the chips fall where they may on that, right? Um, I've made several crime videos here online. You can investigate them for bias, whatever, right? I just don't see it here. I would have voted to acquit on all three charges. I think the jury here had to make a decision to make a statement and had to overlook things like Hennepin County Medical Examiner Andrew Baker's testimony that it was a multifactorial process that led to George Floyd's death. Understand, when Attorney Nelson in his closing for the defense uses the phrase multifactorial process, he's literally quoting Hennepin County Medical Examiner Andrew Baker. Those are Andrew Baker's words. When there's reference to fatal dose of fentanyl, fatal, that's Andrew Baker's words. Right? An undetermined cause of death. Those are Maryland State M.E.'s, David Fowler's words, his conclusion. So here you have, in a case where one M.E. just flatly says the cause of death is undetermined, and the other M.E., the one who did the autopsy, is talking about a fatal dose of fentanyl. Here you have a murder two, murder three, and manslaughter conviction. No one disputes, no one disputes that the police tried to get George Floyd in the police car. No one disputes that the reason George Floyd is not in the police car is because he refuses to be put in the police car. No one disputes that the cops tell him We'll roll down the windows for you. We'll turn on the air conditioning for you. No one disputes that. But yet this jury found murder two, murder three, and manslaughter. Let me close by saying this. Much has been made of nine minutes and 29 seconds. Right? Can we agree? that for several of those minutes, George Floyd is talking with the police. Right, he says he can't breathe several times. He starts talking about his mother, right? He starts yelling for his mother, right? Can we agree that he's talking? So the film shows he's not being deprived of oxygen during that period of time. He has enough oxygen to actually be talking. You understand that Chauvet is not on his neck because George Floyd's able to turn his head. Right, you see that on the film. Now let me just point out that the nine minutes and 29 seconds, when you hear Andrew Baker's conclusion that George Floyd's airways are not blocked, not blocked, doesn't that diminish the importance of the nine minutes and 29 seconds? Right? You're hearing that his airwaves are not blocked during the nine minutes and 29 seconds. Now I know 
They had exotic expert witness testimony. The expert, Tobin, who, you know, sliced and diced the film and got destroyed by the defense closing that showed that Tobin was literally picking pieces of film that did not support his narrative. Now, we know that there's a storyline out there that, well, look, even though his airways were open, his lungs may have been compressed so that he could not fully breathe and was slowly deprived oxygen. But we know that his brain doesn't show oxygen deprivation. More importantly, doesn't the issue of the unblocked airways go to Derek Chauvin's state of mind? Right? If there are unblocked airways, if Derek Chauvin is administering the hold, and we heard from his trainer, right? The defense produced a police trainer who talked about how Chauvin was doing the restraint properly. If Derek Chauvin is doing the restraint in such a way where George Floyd's airways are open, unobstructed, where Chauvin himself is not bruising George Floyd's neck, because again, the evidence shows no neck bruising, either on the surface or under the surface on the muscle then doesn't that go to Derek Chauvin's state of mind? How could you be assaulting someone if you're allowing them to have open airways? How would Derek Chauvin know that George Floyd is on fentanyl, has blocked heart arteries, and is vulnerable to being unable to breathe, even when he has open airways. Let's just say, I think the jury consciously made a decision that they were going to make a statement here. Right? Jury nullification is legal. I believe the jury made a statement and deliberately or inadvertently overlooked a lot of evidence. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Let's keep the dialogue going. I hope you do so in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for, Thanks for stopping by.